just a, a, a twofold comment to make clarification and uh, clarification with regard to the last session. And back to Psalm 104, where we read there and use that to put in our thinking the breath of life and also the, the, the spirit and uh, the spirit that is in man and God himself, as we mentioned in Hebrews 12, being the father of spirits. In other words, he's the father of spirits in the sense that he's the one that gives spirits to spirit beings. He is the father of all spirit life. He's obviously the father of all life. Now, it goes on, and in Psalm 104, verse 29, Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. And then, uh, to take that back and make distinction, when we come to the flood, and in chapter 7, and verses 21 through 23, you have the effects of the flood. Now, back in chapter 6, which Keith is going to cover, or attempt to cover, it tells us that, uh, verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so we've been thinking about Noah and his connection to the earth. They're not completely separate. And Noah being put in dominion over the earth as God's viceroy, as God's representative, when he when he became flesh, when he sinned and disobeyed against the creator, the ramifications of that affected the whole earth, all life on earth. And Keith has mentioned that from Romans chapter 8, that the whole of creation has been subjected to vanity. So when we come here, Again, in chapter 6, we read in verse 17, And behold, I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. It's just important to clarify that only the human being has a spirit. We're, I'm not saying that animals, beasts of the field, have spirit. Yet, they do have the breath of life. They are beings in whom the breath of life that comes from the creator is. But only man has spirit. So, when we come to... Um, uh, the effects of the flood, and notice again how it is that God brought this judgment on all flesh. Man became flesh. Man sinned, rejected the spirit, and in the sense the judgment is consistent with what man did. You want to be flesh? You don't want spirit? I'll give you what you want. And the waters it was a judgment that drowned them. In other words, it cut off the breath in the nostril. And when it cut off the breath in the nostril, it exposed flesh for what flesh is in its separation from God. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't do it with water, did he? He destroyed them with fire. Not here. God didn't use fire. God used water. And God used water because he was going to render a judgment consistent with what the sin was. Have it your way. 
You want to be flesh? Be flesh. This is what flesh is. So you come into chapter 7, and it tells you the effect of that judgment. And the effects of that judgment is verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, human being, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth and Noah only remained alive and they that were in him with him in the ark. Does that clarify things? Uh, Keith, would you say? So we're not, and I'm not trying to insinuate that all animals have spirit. No, they have the breath of life. And that was given to them by God. But only man had spirit. And God had said in chapter 6, verse 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. For that he also is flesh. Any questions or comments with regard to that? We good? Now, the only other thing that I would say is that, you, you, you know, and, and I, 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 I believe that this will apply to Keith, and, you know, not that we've discussed it and so on, but, you know, He's here and, and he's expounding scripture. I'm here, I'm expounding scripture, but I'm also when I'm expounding scripture, I'm learning and I'm searching. And this is what this study is for. And thank God there's a spirit of redemption here. There's a spirit of the body of Christ here where this is what we do. We provoke one another, don't we? And we exhort one another to study scripture and to learn and we exchange and we interact. And so there's a safety net here. And the safety net here is that we're amongst brothers in the Lord, we're amongst friends. And there's liberty to stretch our minds and our imaginations as to getting our hands and our minds around the meaning of scripture. And if in doing so, I happen to uh, go beyond where I should have gone, well, I've got him here. I've got you here, and and to keep me in line, I used to call uh, Randy my safety net, Randy Amos. I miss that brother a lot because he was a very good friend, and we used to talk every week regularly. And the thing about Randy for me was that I would call him up as I would see certain things in Scripture, or I would listen to ministry from others, and it would trigger certain concepts in Scripture. Did I get this right? And sometimes I would even add to it in my mind, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, am I going off the deep end on this one? And I'd call the brother up, and I'd say, hey, what do you think about this? And then uh, he was a safety net. He could always come back to me, and he could always challenge me, and tell me, you need to be careful here, you need to be careful here, be careful here, be careful. And what a blessing that is, isn't it? We all need that kind of safety net, don't we? But here, thank God, we're amongst brothers in the Lord. And thank God we have the liberty to ask questions. Questions that, you know, I mean, I, you don't have to worry about asking a stupid question. You don't have to worry about asking a wrong question. Uh, we have respect for the word of God. We have carefulness in how we handle the word of God. But we're all in this wondrous journey together of growing in the grace and knowledge of the one in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. Amen. Yes. yes, sir. Question. Is, is there any difference between soul and spirit? That, Keith is going to answer that one. <laughs> I don't feel like I can do that very accurately, having not been over that 
recently myself, brother. So I, generally, I've always thought of soul as the emotional and intellectual aspect of man versus spirit is that part that interacts with God. Um, so in that sense, animals are soulish in their behavior sometimes. You can see a dog gets disappointed uh, if you leave it. My, my puppy cries when we leave the house. But that dog doesn't have the interaction with God spiritually that a human being would be. So that would just be my kind of rule of thumb answer. Uh, my hesitation is that I don't have the scriptures at my fingertips to back that up right now. So maybe by and by some brothers can help us with that if you'll, if you'll let that happen. I just want to make a few simple statements about chapter five and then move into chapter six, which we are going to cover, but not thoroughly, because tomorrow we have to deal with a lot of things beyond. And I'll just say, first of all, personally, by way of testimony, I've been coming to a lot more of this kind of study as an attendee, as a learner, than I have as a teacher. So I well remember the first one I came to at 17 at Greenwood Hills, and I was very quickly at sea in the amount of information that was being fired my way. And every single year, I always get to this point where I sort of hit a brick wall in my mind where I think like, ah, oh, I just can't take that in right now, you know? But the beautiful thing is we record it, we make notes, we can go back and revisit things. And some things I've heard in past studies later in my own study or later in another meeting at the local church or another conference somewhere, I get insight into that. So we grow and, and we learn more. So I want to encourage any brothers that are feeling like, man, this stuff is way up here and I'm not getting it. I mean, don't worry. Get what you can. Go away with a big idea. Okay. Secondly, the New Testament tells us that the Lord Jesus has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So when we look back to the Old Testament, we got to remember it's progressive revelation. And it's not expressing things with the theological clarity that we're accustomed to in the New Testament epistles, for example. So when we go back and read some of these terms and about some of these things, it, it's hard sometimes to know and to understand uh, matters of, you know, the state of people when they died and so forth. But we do know certain principles from the New Testament that Salvation has always been through faith and the provision that God would make. And we know that provision to be in his son, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't always, they certainly didn't have the clarity we have on that because it hadn't been revealed to them yet. But they knew the seed of the woman would come. They knew there's going to be a sacrifice that takes care of it. They knew, as Abraham knew, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided in Genesis 22 and so forth. So just remember that when you're looking at the Old Testament, read it through the lens of the New Testament and build your doctrine around the New Testament. I stress that because there are a lot of cults that go back to the Old Testament and they cherry pick different scriptures and they start teaching things like there's no immortality of the soul. So when you die, if you don't know the Lord, you're just annihilated. Or they start teaching universalism where everybody's ultimately going to be saved or they start teaching other things that are very fanciful go to the bedrock of the crystal clear statements of the new testament and then go back to the old testament to see that illustrated i just throw that out there absolutely as good principles as we study the word of god now just some simple things about enoch that i've enjoyed and appreciated and nothing's original and you've doubtless seen these before, so I just want to remind you. But what's stressed about Enoch and what was different about him is, of course, as Henry has pointed out, that he did not die. In a genealogy where, and he died, recurs throughout, before and after. Enoch is the exception. He doesn't die. He was not, for God took him. And uh, the same language is used in Hebrews 11, verse 5, talking about him, although it's quoting from the Old Testament Greek translation, the Septuagint. And it's interesting that there, Hebrews 11 points out to us 
before he was translated, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And you read it here in our English Bibles in verses, uh, verse 22, for example, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Now you don't see Enoch pleased God anywhere there because this is a translation in English of the Hebrew scriptures, which were the original scriptures. God gave Genesis in Hebrew. And that's what Moses wrote it down in. But when the Jews, many years after Moses, in the intertestamental period, came to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, because like us, they wanted people to understand the word of God in their own language. They wanted people to get it. A lot of missionaries that do this sort of work refer to it as their part language. They translate it this way. Enoch had this testimony, or it, rather they'd say, Enoch pleased God. Or actually, Enoch was well-pleasing to God. Some translate it that way. So I look at this and I say, ah, this is something mathematical. Math for a history major. I was a history major. And history majors aren't known. There are exceptions. But we aren't known to be good at math. And I'm certainly part of the general mass of people who like history that I'm not fond of math. But I can get this. If you look on a piece of paper and you said, Two plus two equals four. You realize what's to the left and the right of that equal sign are, of course, equivalent. They're two different ways of expressing the same thing. So what we get here is two different ways of expressing the same thing. We have the Hebrew scriptures telling us Enoch walked with God. And we have the New Testament using the Greek scripture saying Enoch pleased God. And so I say to myself, again, with my imaginary piece of paper, on one side, I got walk with God equals pleased God. You want to please God? Walk with God. Spend time with God. Amen. After all, the last time we saw God walking in Genesis was chapter three, when he comes walking in the cool of the day. And he's not able to have the interaction he wants to have with human beings because they're now separated. It's a good way when we talk about death and spiritual death and physical death, or even the second death, think of the word separation. Physical death is when your soul and spirit are separated from your body. So that incorporeal part of you, that part that we can't see, that you can't see on an X-ray or an MRI or a CT scan, that part that nevertheless is a real part of us, that's separated from our body, as we've heard. But you can be walking around. You can be respirating. You can have brain activity. You can meet all the physiological criteria for having physical life. And you can be a dead man walking, can't you? As Ephesians 2.1 reminds us, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what's that mean? What does it mean to be dead in trespasses and sins? As Henry pointed out. Not dead morally, not dead psychologically or in activity, but dead as far as God's concerned. We're separated from God in other words. And then, of course, the second death is when those two things unfortunately coincide. When someone dies physically, being in a state of spiritual death, that is confirmed for eternity. And so the second death is eternal separation from God separation in each case. That really helps me to think about it. Now, by contrast, Enoch walked with God. Enoch was living in a wicked world. How do I know? I know because Jude talks about what Enoch preached in, I think it's Jude verse 11, how he prophesied against ungodly sinners. <laughs> he was living in an ungodly world. He was in better times than our times. You know, sometimes we think well, we, we have it much worse. You know, it used to be better in this country and there used to be more Christians or at least there used to be more respect for Christianity. And we can kind of look back on the past with rose-colored glasses. But let me tell you, in every age, it is difficult in this world to live for God. And the only way you can do it is by a personal relationship with God through faith. 
You can't do it in your own strength. I can't do it in my own strength. So what marked him out from everybody else of his time was this is a man who walks with God. This is a man who knows God. He spends time with him. He has a relationship with him. And of course, as Hebrews 11 reminds us, he pleased God. That's what God wants from us. Amen. Now think of it. You might say to yourself, well, I can't explain the scripture like Henry Sardinia can, or like fill in the blank of some Bible teacher you've heard that you really respect. Well, Odds are they've had decades more of experience studying the word of God. Or maybe God has just given them that gift and he won't ever give you the same gift. He won't give you the same kind of gift or even if you have the same kind of gift, it might not be at that same level. What we can do for God is sometimes limited by our physical limitations or our mental limitations or family responsibilities or our job or our school or whatever it is. We can't all do the same thing. The beautiful thing is God doesn't call us all to do the same thing. Amen. God has unique things he wants you to do, unique things he wants me to do, and we need to look to the Lord to give direction in that. But what we all can do, every one of us, whatever age, however long or short we've known the Lord, we can walk with God because it's as simple as lifting your heart to the Lord Amen. and crying out to him in prayer. It's as simple as opening up the Bible, even on your phone, if need be, if that's all you can do. And you've got two minutes at lunchtime. Spend those two minutes with the Lord. You know that people, I remember reading the journals of Jim Elliott when he was in college and he was super busy with his academic studies. He was a Greek major at Wheaton. So he had very demanding classes and he had all these things. Plus he was in all these activities, many evangelistic and service type activities. And yet he said, I find that I've got to read the scriptures not only in the morning, but I've got to read it at noon and I've got to read them at night. Now, I'm not trying to put a burden on anybody of saying you have to do this three times a day or you have to pray so many times a day. That's between a person and the Lord. But there are some times where even in the business of life, you realize I've got to do whatever I can to use every spare minute for the Lord. And I, I've got to take time. I've got to carve it out somewhere. Ephesians would call it redeeming the time that I would make this time to walk with God. And even in my activity, as I'm at work, walk with God. I remember Henry in his testimony talking about when he was saved and working for the telephone company, he'd sometimes be praying, Lord, help me how to figure this out. Because he'd go in there and there'd be all these different wires and he needed to know how to put the right one in the right place. I hope I'm not misquoting you there. I think I've, I've given the sense of what you said anyway, go ahead. But, you know, many times we do that in our job or we do that in our school. Lord, I'm not getting this equation. I'm not getting this concept that I'm reading. Or many times in our inner reaction or our inner relationship, rather, with people, we have to go to the Lord in our heart and say, Lord, help me out here. I, I really don't know what to say to this person. This was a life where he was accustomed to spending time with the Lord. We're going to notice the other person that that's said about is Noah, and that comes in chapter 5. Now, I love the beautiful picture we have of Enoch. I'm oh, sorry, chapter 6. I love the beautiful picture we have of Enoch as being a harbinger of things to come. He's a preview of the rapture. That here's a man who's accustomed to spending time with God on earth. He walks with the Lord. And one day... God takes him home to glory. He doesn't take him home through death. Many other saints, most other saints in history have been taken through death, haven't they? And isn't it wonderful that we can say absent from the body, present with the Lord? So as 1 Thessalonians 4 points out, we're not losing out. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And so we rejoice in that. But nonetheless, He's a preview of what God can do, that death doesn't have the last word, that our God is the God of resurrection, 
Our God is ultimately going to be victorious over death and the earth. He already has been victorious in that his son has risen again from the dead. And yet we still go to funerals, don't we? And we still read in obituaries. And we still hear about friends and loved ones dying all the time. But that's going to be a thing of the past. That's for a limited time only. Because already the Lord Jesus has defeated death. And that's the wonderful thing. And Enoch is a picture of that. That he is walking with the Lord and someone is sort of imagined the Lord saying something to this effect. Well, Enoch, we're just a bit closer to my home today. I'm taking you home with me. And Enoch was not, for God took him. Now, Noah has a different experience. Noah is going to go through the flood. He's not going to be saved by being translated to heaven, but he's going to go through that which was, physically speaking, death to everybody else on earth. He's going to go through this time when the wrath of God is being poured out on the earth and he's going to be saved. And of course, we know there are a group of believers that this is going to happen to. No, not mid-trib people or post-trib people. I'm speaking of the future remnant that comes to know the Lord in the tribulation period. And there will be many people in Israel that will come to know Jesus is their Messiah. They will come to hail him as Lord, and worship him, and proclaim his gospel. And yes, some will be martyred by that, but Zechariah 12 and following tells us that that nation is going to turn to the Lord, and the Lord is going to come and deliver them through this time period of wrath. He will shelter them and ultimately deliver them to the kingdom that he establishes on earth when our Lord Jesus comes at his second coming to earth to sit on the throne of David. So don't get confused here. Enoch, we think about the rapture for the church. That's in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 says. When we talk about the remnant of Israel in the future tribulation, that's the Lord coming back to the earth, to the Mount of Olives, and physically defending the nation as well as spiritually restoring them and taking them into the kingdom. But... Many of the prophets uh, would indicate that many peoples shall be added to the Lord in that day. Zechariah 2 says that, for example. And that tells us that not only are Jews going to be saved and put their trust in the Lord Jesus, but also many Gentiles are going to be saved. Now, I realize in their zeal to see people come to Christ right now, because people do need to deal with the truth they hear, right? They they shouldn't put it off. Sometimes gospel preachers make it sound like nobody's getting saved in the tribulation. And I tell you, hearing the gospel in this dispensation is no guarantee that we'll have any other opportunity if we're around for the next dispensation. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to come to the Lord. So that's very true. But on the other hand, apparently there's a lot of people that have not heard a clear presentation of the gospel, that don't know Genesis from Revolution, so to speak, that don't know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. That's a joke, but I realize you men are weary, and it was a poor joke. Like that. Oh, no. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but you know, um, there are going to be these many people, a great multitude, John sees, can't be numbered. that can't be numbered, that are saved in that tribulation period. And why? It's because God's desire is to save people. And God's going to keep saving people right on through and into and including the millennium. Now, as I understand it, the millennium starts out with believers, with the sheep going into that kingdom, as it were. But their children aren't all going to be believers. They're going to have to believe for themselves, aren't they? And the amazing thing is that Revelation 20 tells us at the end of that millennium, there are some that will reject perfect government, not reject Bidenomics, not reject, I'll get to you in a moment, Brother Daniel, not reject Trump, not reject any, you know, Putin or whomever you want to put in the blank of any government we might have a complaint about. We're talking about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, who is perfect. And they're still going to say, we don't want that kind of world. Thank you very much. We're going to try to topple him. And it shows you the incorrigibility of the human heart that still 
there will be some people, even when the evidence is right there in front of them, they're going to say, I don't want this man to reign over me. Yes, Brother Danny. No, I just wanted to repeat the beginning of that point about when we believers um, are in the new millennium. Or, or, um, <laughs> okay, so when we talk about the millennial kingdom of Christ, the Lord's reign on earth, it's part of the fulfillment of God's promise to King David, what we call the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, that David is going to have a descendant to reign on his throne. And that promise is amplified in Psalm 89 and in the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others. And the Lord Jesus is going to come and fulfill all those prophecies. He is going to restore Israel to himself as the new covenant would indicate. They will be his people. But lots of Gentile nations that haven't rejected Israel's God are also going to begin that kingdom. Now, where's the church going to be? We're going to be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus. I base that on passages like 2 Timothy 2 that says, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. And we have many different scriptures that talk about many of the Lord's parables, for example, that talk about us reigning over different cities and so forth. You've been faithful over a little, be thou faithful over much. So the kingdom starts out with believers. The people that go into the kingdom that have survived the tribulation, whether they be Jews or Gentiles, are going to go back to having long lifespans. Isaiah tells us that if they die at 100, it's like they're dying in early childhood. childhood, you know? So they're going to live long lifespans like they did in the early days of Genesis. And they're going to fill the earth, as the Lord told Adam to do. We're going to see the fulfillment of these things. But some of that offspring that have been born to people who came into the millennium eventually are going to follow Satan when he's loosed for a little season at the end of that thousand year period. And you can find that in Revelation 20, where it speaks about the rebellion of Gog and Magog. And the Lord's swiftly going to bring judgment on that and then follow it with the great white throne judgment. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, if I just may ask you a quick question. Sure. Um, what happens after the Great White Throne Judgment? Okay, after the Great White Throne Judgment, we have the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, as Second Peter 3 says. So you have believers that are there with the Lord, and you can read beautiful descriptions about that in Revelation 21 and 22. Yeah. And of course, for the unbeliever, you have the fulfillment of what the Lord talked about in passages like Matthew 7, when he says, depart from me, you who work iniquity, I never knew you. So for the believer, believers, of course, go on into that new heavens and new earth wherein dwells righteousness. For the unbeliever, whose name isn't written in the Lamb's book of life, because they've never received the Lord Jesus, they've never received and believed God's truth, they're going to be separated from the Lord for eternity. And the Lord Jesus described that in many passages as being cast into outer darkness or uh, being sent to the lake of fire is ultimately what Revelation is going to call it. Yeah, because I've, I've definitely read Revelation, or at the very least, the end of Revelation many times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me being human and not knowing too many conclusions for me, I you know, try to think of like, well, dang, well, what is this new heaven and new earth really like? Like, how can it be compared to maybe our lives now or mm -hmm. Genesis? Yeah. And it obviously it does give descriptions, but of course, there's still a lot to be left in that debate. Probably, sure. We already know for good reason. Yeah. The best thing about it is the Lord is there. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the wonderful thing that we're going to, as uh, him says, we're going to love the Lord with unsinning heart. So to have no distraction and no impediment to full enjoyment of the Lord and continue learning from the Lord, serving the Lord, um, you know, operating in his government, which Isaiah 9 says, of the increase of his government, at least there shall be no end. So the ramifications of this are just expanding through eternity. We will never be bored with the Lord. Right. I heard a missionary give a very good example about uh, someone he worked with in South America. He said this brother did a lot of work in the jungles among 
very primitive people that didn't know anything. They had never seen modernity, never been out to a town or a city. And so they were asking him what his homeland was like. And he was from Australia. And so he's thinking, how do I explain electricity? And so <laughs> he says, uh, you know, in my homeland, at the time where you're sitting around the campfire now, you know, at nighttime, basically, he says, we can make it bright as noonday. And the people said, oh, there must be no night in his country. Or in that part of the jungle, to travel anywhere, they have very windy, circuitous rivers and streams and the jungle canopy so thick you can't walk through it. You gotta go in a canoe and it can take you days just to go a few miles. And he said, you know, basically this village here to go to this other village that was probably the farthest one away they knew. He said, we can do that in less than a day, you know, trying to describe the travel abilities that we have with cars and trains and planes. And they said, well, in his world, there must not be any distance, you know, and on it went. He had to describe his world by things that weren't there. So when you come to Revelation 21, for example, we're told that there's no more crying. There's no more pain. There's no more death. There's no more darkness. And you don't even need the sun and the moon because the Lord God and the Lamb are the light there. So as somebody has said, we're told a lot more about what isn't in the new heavens and the new earth than about what is, because we simply can't comprehend the beauty of it and all of what it's going to be like. And yet we know it's going to be fantastic because A, the Lord is there, and B, all the stuff we hate that's been painful and bad for us that's not there. So it's definitely something to make us anticipate it with great eagerness. Is there, maybe, maybe there's another time where I can be asking more questions. Uh, probably oh, absolutely. Uh, we do have question time built in. We'll see how it goes tonight. Someone is supposed to give a participant message by the schedule, but sometimes we've had brothers not do that. And if, if we have more time later, we can certainly do a QA. and a and uh, Henry and I are always around to talk, and I know many of the brothers are around to talk about these things further. So feel free, brother. Please don't be afraid to ask questions, and uh, we want to make ourselves available for that. So let us know if we're progressing and there's too many questions and too little time. We'll try to budget more time for that. Now, just if I may return to chapter six quickly, because uh, I don't want to transgress on the schedule too much. But Henry's already told us about the beginning of Genesis 6, of this incursion that we have into humanity, and how it seems to be that when we're talking about the sons of God, that these are spirit beings, these are what we might think of elsewhere in the Bible as demons that are coming and are having relations with the daughters of men. Now, it's often been said that the Lord says to the Sadducees, for example, in Matthew 22, that they didn't understand really what heaven was like, because he said in heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. And yet the key phrase there is that prepositional phrase, in heaven. It doesn't mean that angels at any point in the history, couldn't come into the earth and do certain things physically, okay? Now, I'm not saying they do this today, but this seems to be a unique time period in history when they did this. And I do believe that those passages in 1 Peter 3 and 2 Peter 2 that refer to the spirits that are kept in chains of darkness, and Jude would also refer to this, probably refers to this time. That's an inference, not a thus saith the Lord. But uh, certainly there are things that have happened in the spirit world that have ongoing repercussions and they don't happen again. Like Satan fell, that's not going to happen again. That's kind of an unrepeatable event. And there were many beings that obviously fell with him or followed the same pathway 
because we have the Lord Jesus when he comes to earth in his ministry, meeting many of these unclean spirits or demons as the New Testament calls them. So it seems to be a satanic incursion, again, to spoil humanity. And when you think of the Lord promising through the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head, if we could mess up humanity and use the woman to corrupt the human genome or something like that, maybe this can alter the plan. I don't know if that is really what they were thinking, but for whatever reason, there's this incursion, and the result is uh, very evident in chapter 6, because we read not only are those mighty men that Henry referred to, these heroes that maybe are the basis of some of the legendary figures, yeah. like how do you come up with an idea of Hercules, you know, and all the challenges that Hercules had to do? Well, I'm not saying everything in Hercules actually happened. Uh, Michael Bolton had a great theme song, but um, no, I'm just kidding. Different different treatment of Hercules. But anyway, people just aren't up on 90s culture. But anyway, I'm getting old. That's the problem. Uh, but, you know, you look back to the Greco-Roman heroes and the things they supposedly did. And you can kind of hear echoes of what maybe some of these early people did. But again, what they undoubtedly would have thought of as progress, because after all, if I suddenly am bigger and stronger than the other human beings around me, or I'm faster, or I'm brighter, uh, human beings would say, well, that's great. We're evolving, right? We're progressing upward. But even in modern history, We've seen people with great natural gifts totally pervert those gifts and put themselves into the hands of Satan, really, to influence multitudes to do evil. And you all have only to watch a little old footage of Adolf Hitler giving a speech to see that kind of thing. You know, Lenny Riefenstahl filming these rallies that they would have in the stadiums in Nuremberg and places like that. And all the people that were shouting and screaming and loved him. Now, not everybody there. Loved him. Not everybody was going along with him. Not everybody, even people that didn't violently oppose him. Not everybody was sitting around saying, oh, this is terrific. Any more than everybody is sitting around approving of our current administration or the previous one or the one previous to that or whatever. You know, people could be in disagreement, but there's no doubt millions of people were transfixed. And not only by him, people were transfixed by Mussolini in Italy. They were transfixed by Stalin in the Soviet Union. In a way, they were transfixed by FDR in the United States. And not everything that our country did in that time period was righteous either. So, you know, we can see people with tremendous abilities, and yet it's used for wickedness. And we see that in 6 verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now, the word saw there, one uh, Jewish scholar points out that this wasn't just a glimpse. This word entails careful observation, and that God acts out of carefully observing what, what goes on. Later in chapter 11, we'll see God says, come, let's go down to see the tower that they begin to build. God doesn't judge without having the facts. There's always a thorough investigation. And of course, it's a perfect investigation. He has all the information. There's nothing that is suppressed or hidden from his eyes. He knows what's going on. And he sees that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on the evil continually. The word intent was a word used of God earlier in the book about things that God fashioned, about an idea that God had to create in his mind, that great creativity of God. And what does God create? God creates things that are good, things that are for our benefit. And yet this is the opposite. Not only did they do evil, but everything they were thinking about and planning was corrupted by evil as well. And verse 6 says, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. Now, what a sad statement that was. He was grieved in his heart, it says. This word grieve is used elsewhere in the Old Testament, such as in 2 Samuel 19, 
when it talks about the people watching David weep after his son was killed, Absalom died, and the king is just grief stricken. And they said, the king is grieved over the death of his son. Well, here God was looking at sin and it grieved him in his heart. Now, people like to posture. They like to go on television and say, God, where were you at Columbine? You know, if there's a God, why doesn't he do something about what's happening in Ukraine or Syria or India or name your catastrophe of the week? Because we're living in a fallen world that's groaning and men are doing many evil things. And people so often want to lay it at the doorstep of God. But I'll tell you, nobody's more upset over evil and sin than God in a certain sense. And I say that reverently. Not upset in the sense that God loses his temper. Not upset in the sense that God didn't know what was going on. And one day somebody told him, hey, have you seen what they're doing in the earth? No, God knew it from the beginning. He knew it before he made the earth. But this is expressing it in such a way that we can really grasp. God hates sin. Why? Because God loves people. And what does sin do to people? Sin perverts people. It twists people. It corrupts people. Ultimately, it kills people. James says, sin, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth death. And so it says he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them. So sad, isn't it? Now, we read in verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, what did God tell Adam back in Genesis 1? Go out and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it. This is not what God had in mind when he said, fill the earth. He was meaning, go out and fill it with children. Go out and fill it with human beings to enjoy what I've made. Go out and fill it with people that will develop all the incipient potential of this planet that will take what I've put in seed form, so to speak, and will cultivate it and guard it and tend it for my glory. And instead, what does mankind do? They corrupt the earth and they fill it with violence. And you might say, well, it's all doom and gloom, isn't it? It's all judgment. And God makes this pronouncement of judgment that he's going to destroy because he says, for I'm sorry that I've made them in verse seven. But I love verse eight. But Noah found grace Amen. in the eyes of the Lord. And there was a dear brother who was most helpful to me when I was in my teenage years in teaching me the Holy Scriptures, and he used to tell me over and over, and it's never left me, that in every age, no matter how bleak it seems, no matter how dark it becomes, no matter how rampant the evil, God always has a remnant. God is never utterly defeated. The light is never completely extinguished. He has a remnant, and here that remnant's found in Noah and is found and we read in verse 9 about the generations of Noah. He's described as a just man, perfect in his generations. Now, that doesn't mean this was a man who was sinlessly perfect, as we'd say. it. He wasn't a man who never fell or never sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 tells us the one notable exception to that being God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. But when we say he was a just man, here was a man that cared about God's righteousness. And here was a man who wanted to be right with God and then wanted to act rightly toward his fellow man in knowing his God. And God described him as perfect in his generations. Uh, a lot of the scholars use words like blameless, or they speak about his integrity. That here's a man who, while he did sin, like everybody sins, he did fail sometimes. The trajectory of his life was Godward. His eyes were toward the Lord. He was seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, as the Lord would tell us to do in Matthew 6. He was trusting in the Lord 
and not leaning to his own understanding, like we quoted Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 earlier this study. And he was walking with God. Noah walked with God, it says. So like Enoch, the most important thing in Noah's life was his relationship with God. Now, I don't know what epitaph you might have for your tombstone if you die before the Lord comes. But it's hard to improve on a just man of integrity who walked with God. That's pretty good. <laughs> and why was he a just man of integrity? Well, because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It started with the grace of God. It started with the salvation that God gave him. And how did that salvation come to Noah? Hebrews 11 tells us, by faith, Noah being warned of things not as yet seen, built an ark to the saving of his household. But Hebrews 11 gives us the other side, doesn't it? Not only did he save his household, but he condemned the world. And that's what the gospel does, doesn't it? On the one hand, it provides hope. It provides deliverance. It provides a rescue from the wrath that's coming. But on the other hand, it says there is the wrath of God. There is the righteous punishment of God. His justice is going to be done on the earth. And evil is not going to prevail. It's going to be stamped out by God. But God chooses this man and his family. And Noah looks to the Lord by faith and begins to build this ark at God's instruction. Now, verse 13 says, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. And so he tells him to make an ark of gopher wood. And interestingly, not only says make rooms in the ark, but he says cover it inside and outside with pitch. Cover is a verb that's going to appear a lot in the Old Testament, specifically in the sense of atonement. And this ark that he's building is going to be a picture of atonement, a picture of how God saves people through judgment. That because they're in the ark, the judgment comes against the ark, and the ark bears it for them and bears them through to safety. And as many a gospel preacher knows, you've probably preached the gospel from it yourself. It's a lovely picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? That's why the New Testament so often tells us about being in Christ, Amen. in Christ, Amen. in Christ. It's that position before God of our being in Christ that delivers us from the wrath to come, that promises we shall never be lost and we shall never suffer the wrath of God. But when we think about God calling Noah, it's interesting how you might sometimes sit around here and say, now, this is all very old and arcane. And what does this antiquated story have to do with us anyway? I mean, we live in 2023. Isn't this a lot of just old, very ancient stuff? Even if it happened, what's it have to do with me? And yet the Lord is going to continue to refer back to Noah throughout the scriptures. So, for instance, in Isaiah 54, he will refer to the no waters of Noah that come softly, and he will apply that to the saving work he's doing in Israel in their day. Or in Ezekiel, when Ezekiel wants to tell them how bad things have gotten in Israel, he says, even if Job or Noah or Daniel were here, they would only deliver themselves by their righteousness. And then we come to the New Testament, and Henry's already quoted it, that the Lord Jesus both in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and also in the Gospel according to Luke, the Lord Jesus is going to refer back to the days of Noah, and he's going to compare that to the last days. And whereas Genesis emphasizes corruption and violence and departing from God's ways and from the standards he has set and trying to reinvent what life is, when the Lord Jesus talks about it, it's interesting. It's very banal, as Henry was describing. It's not the wicked things as much as the commonplace things, the everyday things. They were marrying and giving in marriage. 
They were eating and drinking. They're going about all the quotidian activities of humanity, the things we do every day. And they're doing that as if it's never going to end, as if God doesn't signify it, as if he hasn't said to be ready because this world is passing away and the lust thereof and the judgment's coming and they act as if it never will. And one day they're overtaken with the judgment, therefore. And not just in the Gospels, but also in 1 Peter and in 2 Peter, we're also going to have Noah and the flood referred to. And uh, it's just something that God keeps coming back to, to remind us of these first principles. That we've got to be ready, that the corruption and the violence and even the living life as if there's no God. We may not be a theoretical or philosophical atheist. But many people live like practical atheists. They don't care about God. They never give him a second thought, except when they maybe get into some imminent danger. Then maybe they call out for him. But when the danger is past, they forget him again. And yet God is the ultimate reality, isn't he? He is the one who's most important to know. And the one that is Enoch and Noah in their own way showed us the most important thing about human life is walking with God. And if we don't do that, we're going to be overtaken by judgment. If we don't come into a living relationship with God by faith, where we receive him as our Lord and Savior, and that leads to the life in, with God. In the ark of his provision. Amen. In the ark of his provision. They're going to be delivered to a new world, just as we will. I mean, in a way, it's the same old world. But it's been purified in a sense. That corruption has been washed away. And God in his grace hits the reset button. The great IT panacea. Turn it off and on again, right? That's the first thing you do with your computer or your phone when there's a glitch. <laughs> and God says, okay, we're going to reset. I'm not destroying it forever, full stop. But what I do here is indicative of the fact that I am going to deal with you, that no one's going to get away with it, that my long suffering will have an end, and I will come and judge the world in righteousness. I'm going to do it next time by fire. And I refer to 2 Peter 3, which you can consult, okay, so. where people have this attitude oh, you've been saying that for years. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they always were. That's called uniformitarianism. That things are just uniformly the same in history. And it's all continuing. And you've been saying the judgment's coming and the end is near for years. And we don't think it's ever going to happen because God doesn't intervene in human history. And yet Peter says this they're willingly ignorant of. They choose not to remember, as Freud would put it, that God once did intervene in history by a flood and destroyed the world. And that water's still here. <laughs> And the only reason the land is standing out from the water is because of God's word. Because God said that it should be. And because, as we'll see tomorrow, God put his rainbow in the cloud to indicate the great truth of redemption that spares man from utter destruction. So in about 10 minutes, we're supposed to reconvene. And if a brother has a word, I don't know if you rearrange that, Ezekiel. No. So if someone's led to give a word, you can feel free at 8.15 when we come back, brethren. We'll probably open with a song and a prayer. But you can be thinking about that. And if nobody has anything on their heart, we could maybe deal with some question and answer, as Brother Daniel asked. But feel free. Uh, could a brother close us right now in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the ministry that we've had in it. Well, our minds are really filled with a lot of thoughts. Yeah. Lord, we pray that you help us to just think about this for weeks to come. Amen. And uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, your grace in our lives. We thank you for your favor in our lives, Lord. The fact that we wouldn't even be here. Mm -hmm. Just uh, praise you, Lord. We ask for a good night of rest and sleep for each one. Thank you for each one here. Jesus. Amen. Amen.